Hey, thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's exciting. That's right. We're into the 20th century. And who's the big star of the 20th century? That's right, Adolf Hitler. So we're going to, you had the handout that went over his childhood. Now we're going to go over some of the highlights and up until we got into power. So bear with me. We're going to go fast. I have a lot of it underlined, okay? So, here we go. Boo, did you see a special effect? Look at that handsome devil, isn't he? All right, there he is, little baby. Uh, his years are 1889-1945. And so I asked the question, what century did he do his most damage? Well, up until he was 11, probably didn't do much damage, so we're going to have to call it, the, that's right, the 20th century. Very good. And his B-Day was April 20th, 1889, and I know people celebrate that. And uh, what is his nationality? People always get this wrong. They put German. Guess what? He's not German. He's Austrian, all right? That tells you who's not listening, let me tell you, because that one will be circled. Okay, the religion at his birth was Catholic. He was actually baptized by his mom. And his occupation, you could, could call a politician, soldier, artist is more of a hobby. But don't tell him I said that, because I could die. Um, writer, also, he did write his book. And thank you for asking that. What's his most famous book? It's Mein Kampf, My Struggle in English. Do you know that it's in the library? So you can go over there, stop at the library, read it. But the library's closed, so you can't read it. But in here you go to the public library and they set the books out for you. So if you want to read it. And if one of his many famous quotes, you have a whole calendar with 365 days of Adolf Hitler. And <coughs> make the lie big, make it simple, keep saying it, eventually they will believe it. Alright, that is one you have to write down. And believe me, the modern day politicians, especially the pro-abortions, they really like this, okay? Make the lie big. Okay, write this down right now. Make the lie big, comma. Make it simple. Simple lies are good. Keep saying it, and eventually they will believe it. So, the politicians like this. Especially, the, also the media likes that, might add too. They keep the lies going. So, I'm going to let you pause this. Okay, pause it. Okay, now we're going to the next slide. And who are his parents? And they are, notice the special effects. Uh, he's a fourth, there it is. Alois Hitler was his dad. And Carla Poltz was his mom. And as I have right here, they were not married. Alois was actually on his second wife, who was his maid. He had married a woman very much older for the status and was fooling around with the maid. And then when the lady died, he married the maid. And then while he was married to the maid, then he was fooling around with Carla. And with the other question I have is like, what name of the town he was born in? And that is right there, Brana, Brana. I don't know what it is. I don't know German. Father Kush does. Okay, so get this written down here. I'm not remember. I'm, I'm going to expect you to pause. And number nine, did his father show much affection? No, no. And I think you learned that from your um, from the last paper. And. His practicing Catholic mother did show young Adolf love and affection by his mother, so the answer is, I gave you a hint, so the answer is yes. That would be the second part of nine. And you already had this. Did his father beat him? Oh, he lived across from a large monastery, not that that matters. But yes, uh, there is a lot of evidence that Adolf's father regularly beat him. Uh, during his childhood, it was not usually for discipline to be enforced in that, or it was not unusual. Remember, they were German. It's like, ah, you're going to do this, I'm going to beat you. All right? Ah, tum. Yeah. So, uh, there is proof for that in that uh, 
that article that you read in that handout, he actually footnoted where he got all of his stuff. And there's his mom right there. And there's little young Adolf. Isn't he wonderful? Okay, so next question I think is when did his father die? And that would be, yes, 1903. And what did he die of? Um, you know, I know how to pronounce that, but it's not coming right now. Hemorrhage. And we looked it up too, what that was. Some of you guys are really good in biology, and right now you're yelling at the computer on what that is. That's okay. All right? So that's what he died of. That's number 11. Number 12. Hitler's talents. That, how old was he when he started showing little Hitler here? Artistic talent. He was age 11, so it's right at the turn of the century. He, know, he thinks, I'm a great artist. And um, if you, there's, a, there's even a movie, that was a while back, but it was about these guys that were sent to go ahead of Hitler to get all the, the great works of arts and hide them so that Hitler wouldn't take them. So Hitler was doing that. Hitler had planned on having his own museum after he conquered the world. So while he was taking over countries, he was taking their, their great works of art. So he never really gave up his artistic love as a dictator. He just took people's expensive paintings, that's all. Um, I'm sorry, I digress. Number 14, as a youth, did it, what was his dream? His dream was being an artist. And like I said, he never really gave it up. His dream was to be an artist. And so his mother, after his dad died, you know, Mom, I'm not getting beat anymore. I'd like to be an artist. Mom says, go for it. So there it is, the school that rejected him. In 1906, Adolf was permitted to visit Vienna, but he was unable to gain admission to a prestigious art school. Just think, if he would have got into art school, he might never became a dictator, might have became an artist. And so... Fifteen, what was he not able to do? It's right there. He was, sorry, he was not able to gain admission to a prestigious art school. Okay? So I want you guys to um, write that down. We're going to switch it. So I want you to pause this while you write that down. Again, I, I got to keep moving so I keep the video short. In fact, I want to do some special effects. It's going to be the one on Monday, because hopefully God willing to have the weekend to work on it. So uh, that was number 15. So again, pause it now. All right, we're going to go. Number 16. Oh, that was cool. There's his mom, I think. It might be. His mother developed terminal breast cancer. It was treated by Dr. Edward Block. He was a Jewish doctor who served the poor. And so... You know, it's kind of, there, there's a lot of writing about this because they said, you know, the, the Jewish doctor was, was sometimes not charging people and he really was trying to take care of his mom. After an operation, excruciating, painful, and expensive treatment with a dangerous drug, his mother died when? December 21st, 1907, which put Adolf at um, 18 years old is what young Adolf is. So number 19, what year did his mom die? And so where did he live between that time? <coughs> Vienna is where he was, 1908 to May of 1913. Oh, by the way, uh, was he upper class, lower class? He was middle class family. Uh, and he really, really did not have too many Jewish friends. So that would help him get his prejudice. And so number 18 is middle class. Write that in, middle class. Number 19 says three places he slept at. Virtually penniless, oh, I hit the wrong button. Virtually penniless, bars is one, bars. Flop houses is like a homeless shelter. You just flop down and went to bed. And shelters for the homeless. Uh, I don't know what the difference is. I looked up Flophouse. Ironically, those fi were financed by Jews who were sharing uh, their riches. 
But anyway, so there's three of them here. Now we're going to go to the next one. So again, I want you to pause this. Pause. This is number 19. Okay, unpause. Number 20, where did Adolf develop a hatred for Jews? Now this is not a real picture. Somebody, I think, stuck the ears on him. I did not because I don't want Adolf haunting me, okay? It was during this period in Vienna that he developed his prejudice about Jews, his interest in politics and debating skills. So I asked, where? Yes, Vienna. And we talked about this during the Crusades. It goes, the prejudice they had against the Jews in that area goes back centuries. And, oh, sorry about that. Hopefully you got Vienna because we're going off to the next one. And so now we're at number 21. What did Hitler get from his parents? Was it candy? No, it was, oh. This is more of Vienna, who used the Jews as scapegoats and stereotyped them. There's a lot of stereotypes that were brought out in that Jojo Rabbit movie we saw for a movie night. And so I thought that was pretty good. All right, so we already said Vienna. Hitler was given an inheritance. There's your answer right there. That's after his parents died, he was given an inheritance. There's Hitler with the young ladies. There's Hitler in his time in the military. I think this is probably the same time in the military. Didn't get that Hitler uh, mustache till later. Okay. So we already we got number number 21. And what happened to it? Well, oh, I know. He spent it all right there. What happened to it? He spent it all. So he goes, hey. I got all this money, you know what I'm going to do? Party! Oh yeah, party. Alright. Let's keep going. So, I think this is it. Let me see. Now nope, there's another one. Hitler moved to Munich, Germany in May of 1913. He did so seeking to avoid arrest for evasion of his military service obligation. Dasburg, Austria, and financed by the last installment of the inheritance from his father. So where did he move to in 1913? He moved to Munich, Germany. There's two blanks there. <clears throat> Munich, Germany. I'll repeat that. Munich, Germany. And the answer to why is in bold print. To avoid arrest for evasion of his military service obligation. So in some countries, after you graduate, you have to put so many years in the military, like Israel's that way. Other countries are that way. And of course, not to would be, um, you know, like, uh, yeah, that word right there. You know, desertion, whatever, whatever. So, to avoid arrest, he goes and he moves to Munich, Germany, because he doesn't want to do his military service obligation, okay? But yes, he was in the military. We're going to find that out later. But not now. Now he's trying to avoid it. Yes, Adolf Hitler, who marched his guys all over the world, was evading being in the military. Go figure that one out. All right. So I want you to pause this because you're going to write to avoid arrest for evasion of his military service obligation. Okay, you got to write every word there. And I want you to pause it now. Okay, we're moving on. There's Adolf and a whole bunch of his troops. Look, they line up really nice here. I like that. And World War I started. After less than two months of training, they didn't really train him really long then, Hiller's regiment saw its first combat near Yikes against the British and the Belgians. So this question is number 23, who did he fight? So hopefully you pause it for the last one. Who did he fight? The British and the Belgians. Okay, so they, they were not his friends. They were shooting at him. So keep that in mind. And number 24. Up. Oh, I'm going to go back there. I want you to pause it if you don't have these two written down. Pause it now. And... Hitler did receive an award, two iron crosses for bravery. 
Okay, narrowly escaped death in the battle several times and eventually awarded. Again, what if Hitler got killed in battle? No World War II. And so, what was he awarded? Number 24, two iron crosses. You write that down, pause if you need it, we're going to keep going. And he rose to Lance Corporal, that's as high as he got. That is number 25, Lance Corporal, number 25. In October 1916, he was wounded by an enemy shell, probably from Britain or Belgium, and evacuated to a Berlin area hospital. So, which hospital did they send him? The Berlin Hospital. Okay, I think you can just put Berlin for that one. That's the other half of number 26. The other half of 26. And obviously, if you don't know the first half, you're an idiot. Okay. All right. Number 27. What put him in the hospital in 1918? And that is... Thank you for asking it. After he, covered, he served a total, covered, recovered, he served a total of four years in the trenches. He was temporarily blinded by mustard gas. Attack in Belgium in October 1918. There's your answer right there. He was put in the hospital because he was blinded by mustard gas. Okay, chemical warfare. World War I. Alright, that's number 27. I think we have more here, but in case we don't, you might want to pause it. Blinded by mustard gas. Yep, I'm going back to it. Okay, you're going to pause it. Pause. Okay, we're moving on. Number 28. Where was he when World War I ended? He was in a military hospital. Getting better because he was blinded by mustard gas. Okay, blinded by the light. The date of the end of the war is November 11, 1918. That's when the war ended. November 11, 1918. Okay. He was, he was get, trying to get better when he heard that they signed the treaty. And after the war, the German army employed Adolf Hitler as an educator and a confidential informant. So that is number... Number 21, after the war, what did he do? Educator, and notice there's two blanks, confidential informant. So I had to look that up. By the way, after you write this, we're done with the first side. I think we're doing good as far as time. Um, I hope you agree. Some of you guys I know already paused it a couple times, but that's okay. We can do this. Number 30, I gave the definition. I had to look this up. What is a confidential informant? It's simply a person working for the police to provide information, perform undercover buys, and otherwise impl implicate others in crimes. So, yeah, he's a secret detective dude, and he's working for the government. Ah, and who's the guy that liked his secret police? I know, it was Adolf Hitler, yeah. All right, so instead of you write out the definition, you just have to, the, for two of them in a row, you have confident, confidential informant, all right? So now we're on number 31. At a beer hall in 1919, when at a party did Hitler get to know? What party did he get to know? Oh, there he is right there. The German Workers' Party, yeah, those guys know how to party, let me tell you, a German Workers' Party, oh, yeah. Um, and I said, there's tons of pictures of Adolf, you know, tons of them. So yeah, in his capacity as confidential foreman, Hitler attended a beer hall meeting at the German's Working Party on September 12, 1919. So, number 32, what parliamentary organization was composed of vigilant war veterans who handed, banded together? And that would be the um, Free Corps. Was a paramilitary organization composed of vigilant war veterans who banded together to fight the growing communist insurgency which was taking over Germany. 
So it became part of the free courts. And the free courts crushed this insurgents. Its members formed the nucleus of the Nazis, the Brown Church, which served as the Nazis' party arm. So you notice that number 33 is the exact same answer. Okay, so I'm going to switch, but you should have been able to catch up for that. So this organization of the free courts eventually became the brown shirts, and we're going to find out that we see this word used a lot, Nazi party, but you're going to find out that it actually isn't correct, because Hitler would never have called his party that. But I'm going to get there later. We have a whole two slides on that, because they do it so often in, in a lot of writings that you can steal off the internet. Hitler's service in the army in 1990 appears to have shaped by his commitment to an, um, I used to know this, antisemitism based on social Darwinism race theory, and established of a unified nationalism founded on the need to combat the external internal power of the Jews. Did I even do that? Oh, yes, number 35 is the Jews. Okay, so they saw right away they need a unifying nationalism. We're going to get to Darwinists later. And uh, that one of the persons in the way are the Jews. Okay? Up. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, Jews is, that's only five letters. Okay, that is, um, oh, number 34 was a yes or no. Did his service appear to shape his commitment? And the answer is yes, the Darwin race theory. And 35 is Jews. So now we're at 36. So um, pause it if you need it. Otherwise, we're going on. And there they are signing the Treaty of Versailles. Right there. Everybody staying around, dressed really nice. Ooh, that was cool. Um, there it is. That's when the German con the government ratified the Treaty of Versailles. The terms of the treaty are, this is a long one, you have to pause it. All right, what did the German government ratify? So it's called the treaty. Um, obviously, I underlined the wrong thing. It's the Treaty of Versailles, right there. Treaty of Versailles. Treaty of Versailles. And when you write that down, I'm kind of stalling here because we got A, B, C, and D that you have to write out. Okay, and I expect you all to write that out. So again, Treaty of Versailles, and the first part of the treaty was, and to make it easier, I just underlined the part that you had to have. Okay, A, Germans had to pay, Germany had to pay reparations for all civilian damages. All right? And for instance, um, after Japan surrendered, we actually helped, the United States actually helped Japan rebuild. So the United States didn't want to make the same mistakes of saying, no, we're just going to bill you. So Germany had to pay reparations for all civ civilian damages. Civilian damages. So if a bomb hits your bakery, Germany's paying for it. Okay? So I want you, again, you can pause it. In fact, you will pause it, because after we're done with it, that's when we're going to freeze it. B, Germany also lost her colonies. Remember, this was a time that everybody was getting their own colonies, their own islands, all the ships out, so they took all of them away from Germany. So if I go to the, uh, the Virgin Islands, for instance, and um, by, around the Bahamas and stuff like that, some of those islands were all run by different countries. They speak different languages. I don't remember if one was German or not, but if one was, it could be because it was a German colony. So there it is. You already wrote that down. C, 30-mile strip on the right bank of the Rhine was demilitarized. So from the river over 30 miles, they couldn't have anything belonging to the military. That's what that means. And the Rhine, of course, as you know, is that river. And D, limits were placed on German armaments and military strength. So, for instance, we did that to Japan. Japan, we promised we would watch Japan. Japan was not supposed to have an army or navy or anything like that. Well, when Japan started becoming our ally 
and made really good use of democracy and became a, an economic force, then we said, hey, why don't you build your own army now? And it's pretty small, but uh, they were reluctant because they just enjoyed not spending money on their military. But uh, that's not unusual. So you're supposed to write these four down, what's underlined, and so I want you to pause it now. Okay, number 38. What did Hitler attend September 12th? I think this is going to switch. So you need to pause it. I was right. And the work, the German Workers' Party. That was the meeting he attended. Now he's getting involved. Before he was like this, this secret service guy. And anyway, while you write that down, a few days later he joined the party. His membership numbered 555. The party started counting beginning with 500 in order to pretend a larger membership. Answer to follow. He started with the number 500. So, 39, what did Hitler do to make the numbers of the party larger? He started with 500. So he goes, hey, we got 555 guys in our little club here. We're awesome didn't tell them they started with 500. Um, I don't think that's very honest, but it's Adolf Hitler. He doesn't have to be honest. <laughs> okay, let's keep going. Um, he turned the turning point of Hitler's mesmerizing, I said that right, mesmerizing oratorical career occurred at one such meeting held on October 16, 1919. Hitler's emotional delivery of an impromptu speech captivated his audience. So, when, if you study Hitler, this is a big point right there, that the, they don't use these words lightly. Mesmerizing and captivated his audience. So he could go on for hours and people would just stand, you know, listen like, wow, this guy's awesome. And so this is the beginning of Hitler's political career, okay? So that would be number 40 was yes or no. Hopefully you got that. 41, what is the date that most historians believe was the turning point of his career? That's this date right here, October 16, 1919. October 16, 1919. They see people follow him and say, that guy's got some, he's got a future in front of him. And he did. Oh, they were surprised. Okay, write that down. October 16, 1919. If you don't have this written down, then I want you to pause. Okay, we're going on number 42. Oh, this is the flag. The name of his party was changed to the National Socialist German Workers' Party. Again, this is his name of his party. This is what Hitler would call his own party. Okay? Not Nazi. You would have not used that term in Hitler's presence. National Socialist German German workers party that is number 42 national socialist german workers party okay notice that there's the term socialist here because it was socialist all right so number 43 what was their new symbol their new symbol was the swastika, sticker, sticker, but, um, oh, oh, that's what I wanted to, the red flag with the swastika on it, right there, red flag, white circle, black uh, sticker, yeah, uh, so anyway, you're going to write this down, the red flag with the swastika, which I know I'm not pronouncing right, okay, so, that is why there's a long blank for 43. So what did Hitler buy for his party? Um, I don't know if I skipped that. Yes, we got to go back to that. Ooh, that is... This is number 48. 
So, what is the nickname for Hitler's party that is Nazi? That is number 44. But it was not just a nickname, because again, Hitler would not have used it, nor anybody else in the party. Um, Hitler would never have used the term. So where did it come from? The word Nazi was used as a derogatory term. Okay? Derogatory means as an insult. So um, any good German that belonged to the party, the National Socialist German Working Party, would never have used that term. They would have called the party by its name. Okay, so where did it come from? And that is, this is National Socialist in German, right there. So if you were to pronounce his, his thing in German, you'd be saying that right there. The abbreviation was the party. The acronym was not Nazi. I used to believe that it wasn't. It was the NSDAP. So if you were to say what his party was, if you didn't want to say National Socialist German Workers Party, you would call it the NSDAP. You would have never called it Nazi. Translated English, the National Social German Party. So the answer isn't there yet. More on the term Nazi. The word was coined in the 1920s, a derogatory term. They got the word by combining national, N-A, and this is the word for socialist party. So you see the Z-I and the N-A. Okay, so they're, they're not, this is um, in English, but as you can see from the other one, it was very similar to the uh, German. So it was a slang word, a derogatory term. Oh, you're just not nothing but a Nazi. So the Americans would use that term. Why? Because they didn't like them, okay? You use derogatory terms. I really don't want to think of a derogatory term that you would use, but you probably have used them before, of a group of people, maybe an opposing team or something like that. You coin a derogatory term and you call them that just to make them mad. That's what Nazi was. So you see it in all the literature, like that's what Hitler called his party. The media likes to call Trump a Nazi, but guess what? Nazi is what we're called the National Socialist German Workers' Party. You cannot call a capitalist a Nazi because they were socialists. Okay? So in the English, the NA came from National and the ZI came from Socialism. And so if, that was number 45, um, and the other part, would, would Hitler have called his party that, no way, Jose, and 45, the two words, some of you might have already answered it and put the German word for socialist, socialist and that's okay, but I'm just showing you that's where the word came from, it's a derogatory term, or you can put national socialism. Those were the two that goodbye. Now, 46, can anybody correctly call a capitalist a Nazi? As I said, no, because the party is socialist. Okay, you cannot, it's, it's a total contradictory of terms to call a capitalist a Nazi because they are socialist. But it's done all the time in the media. Why? Because they think you're stupid, that you don't know where the word Nazi came from. Now you know, so when you're hitting, sitting there with your college buddies and they're calling capitalist Nazis, you have to say, excuse me, do you know where they got the word Nazi? Do you know what Hitler's party was called? That's why we're going to have you circle what Hitler's party's called, because I want you to have that memorized. That's the Nationalist Socialist German Workers' Party. Got that? Yes. So... Number 48, what did Hitler buy? Oh, there it is. Um, I don't think I put this. Oh, there it is, 47. Who would use the term Nazi, friends or enemies? Enemies would use that term. Hitler, believe me, there's tons of resources that talk about Germans, their writings and stuff like that. If they were true to the party, they would never use that term. It's a derogatory term. 
it was always the enemies. That's why the United States, they use it. And they use it to this day. And <coughs> it's not the name of his party. Okay, and what did Hitler buy for his new party? Here it is. And remember, there's a long line there, so pause it. An anti-Jewish local newspaper on the verge of bankruptcy. Again, an anti-Jew local newspaper on the verge of bankruptcy. Hitler raised funds to purchase it for the party. Alright, so you're almost done here. So that was number 48. 48, pause it if you need it because we're going to keep going. And the Nazi party began drawing thousands of new members, many of whom were victims of the hyperinflation and found comfort in blaming the Jews for this trouble. See next slide for the hyperinflation. So, number 49, who got blamed? The Jews did. Okay, you have to pause it because they're going to go to the next slide, okay? So you pause it. And now we're going to get the last four done. Hyperinflation. Oh, this is an example. The price of an egg inflated to 30 million times. This is not an exaggeration. 30, minutes, 30 million times of its original price in 10 years. So it said, number 50, how much did the price of an egg increase in 10 years? 30 million times. Okay, that is what we call hyperinflation, 30 million times. In November 8, 1923, Hitler held a rally at the Munich Beer Hall and proclaimed a revolution. Oh, and I did ask that one. Okay, number 51, where, when did Hitler proclaim a revolution? November 8, 1923, and where? The Munich Beer Hall. You notice a beer hall kind of a pattern here? Just saying. Okay. So November 8, 1923, Munich Beer Hall. I want you to pause this now. And now we're moving on. Here's the hyperinflation. You, it, it's hard to read potatoes. 1914, let's call them cents, even though they were marks. Four cents for a pound of potatoes. 1918, it's already went to 12. 1922, it's at $80, if we're going to go dollars. Summer of 1923, 2000. And by November of 1923, 50, I think that's a billion or a trillion. I don't know. I think it's billion. 50 billion. Here it is, eight. Eight cents, we're getting you a dozen eggs. 25 cents in 1918, $180 in 1922, $5,000 in 1923, $80 billion in the November of 1923. Beer! Now this is sacred, people. They were paying in 1914, 13 cents would get you a nice mug of beer. Then, in 1918, it was 17 cents. Then in 1922, it was $60. Then in 1923, it was $3,000. And by 1923, in November, $150 billion would get you a glass of beer. So it went from $0.13 cents to $150 billion in, let's see, in less than 10 years. Isn't that crazy? What about this meat? Per pound, $0.09. Cents. Then $2, then 1200 then 90 then then this is, that might be a trillion, I don't know. And then butter, same thing, huge. So we're going to go off. All right, Great German Hyperinflation. And to pay the war effort, the German government suspended the gold standard and printed money like crazy. That's what got them in trouble. And during the four years of the war, they went from 2.37 billion marks to 33.11 billion marks. They were just producing money. From 1930 to 1918, prices went up 245%. In 1914, a dollar got you 4.21 marks. Four years later, it got you 8.28 marks. And in November 1923, a dollar got you... 
I, I'm going to guess that's in the trillions. Mark. So, number, uh, number 52, in 1923, one U.S. dollar gets you how many marks? So write this down. I'm gonna, you're going to have to pause it because you've got a lot of zeros here, okay? You have 4, 200, more zeros, more zeros, more zeros, okay? So you write down that number on number 52 while you're putting all those zeros down. Um, I'm going to go to 53. How many printing presses were printing money day and night? And that is 2,000 printing presses. 2,000 printing presses with printing money day and night. They couldn't do it electronic like they do now. So for those, that trillion, two trillion dollar relief package, that just came out of thin air. They didn't have to print money out. They just, it just electronically just came out of thin air. So um, back then they had to do it the old fashioned way and print money. 2,000 printing presses a day and night. Okay, we're going to end it right there. I don't think it's a good place to end it, but it's, uh, it's late for me. I want to get this on YouTube for you tomorrow. You also have a one-sided worksheet to do on finishing Hitler childhood. So you got two assignments. This is one of the few days where you have two assignments. And so hopefully you'll get those in tonight. And then you'll have the weekend off. Otherwise, we're going to be bugging you Saturday, okay? So, without any further ado, I want you to pause this because the applauding, the clapping has already started, and I'm going to say bye.